Robert Marshall is a solicitor in holy orders in the Anglican tradition, and he's been serving as auxiliary curate in the Diocese of Dublin since 2002. Uh, he was uh, recently appointed Registrar of the United Diocese of Dublin and Glenda Loch and of the province of Dublin, having been the deputy since 2007. He was a property lawyer for 30 years and um, when he retired in 2009 he returned to TCD graduating MBA. He's been a contributor to the Dictionary of Irish Biography a member and president of the Irish Legal History Society. Uh, his study of ritual litigation in the disestablished church was recently published and he's um, been publishing in the Darson magazine, a series on disestablishment over the past three years. So for all those reasons, we're extremely grateful, Robert, that you are talking to us this evening on, on the topic of disestablishment and its context in the Church of Ireland. So thank you very much. Uh, we look forward to what you have to say to us and um, over to you. Thank you, Russell, and thank you everyone for joining us this evening. It's a great pleasure and an honor to address the society on this topic of the context of the disestablishment of the Church of Ireland. The disestablishment of the Church of Ireland was a process rather than an event, and it began at Westminster with Gladstone's resolutions in the House of Commons during the spring of 1868, calling for the disestablishment of the Church of Ireland and concluding on what we might call Disestablishment Day, the 1st of January, 1871. Thereafter, two processes follow, which lie outside the remit of this paper. The one, reconstruction of an ancient church in Christendom, completed in 1878 with publication of a revised Book of Common Prayer. And the other, the realization of the assets of the church, statutorily vested in church temporality commissioners. That process continued for over 100 years until the church temporalities fund was finally wound up by an act of, by a land act passed by Eructus Aaron in 1984. The central problem of disestablishment was how to turn the church, a centuries old government department to whose ministry the majority of the population did not resort into a voluntary organization for the benefit of its adherents. The legal mechanism was provided by the Irish Church Act 1869. That act, dissolved the union between the churches of England and Ireland on the 1st of January, 1871, provided that the Church of Ireland would cease to be established by law, vested the assets of the Church of Ireland in newly established church temporality commissioners who would administer the statutory scheme and compensate clerical and other church officers. The act also dissolved all ecclesiastical corporations provided that ecclesiastical law exclusive of that relating to matrimony should cease to have effect as law on 1st January 1871, but with one exception repealed none of it, terminated from 1st January 1871, the jurisdiction of the ecclesiastical courts in matters spiritual and temporal. The act provided the mechanism for reconstruction of the church. It removed the prohibition on the holding of synods and delegated conventions or assemblies, authorized the bishops, clergy and laity to elect such representatives as they, the bishops, clergy and laity should appoint to meet in general synod or convention and frame consultations and regulations for the general management and good government of the church. It provided that the ecclesiastical law and any amendment to it duly made during, duly made according to the constitution of the church should be binding upon the members of the church as if they had mutually contracted to be bound and abide by it. It also gave jurisdiction to temporal courts 
to enforce the ecclesiastical laws of the church, but only insofar as they related to church property and against persons bound by the ecclesiastical law and formularies of the church. Finally, the act authorized the crown to grant a charter to incorporate a duly constituted representative body of persons who would hold property for the uses or purposes of the church, notwithstanding the statutes of Mortmen. Setting these points out now perhaps puts the cart before the horse. My hope is that as you follow this paper, you will see how the various principles which informed the drafting arose. I have chosen to do this rather than to tabulate the points in a dry review of the Irish Church Act and the subsequent constitution of the Irish Church. This establishment occurred in three contexts, in Ireland, in Great Britain, particularly Westminster, where Ireland was represented by 100 members of parliament, 28 representatives of the Irish peerage, an archbishop, and three Irish suffragans. The final context is the empire. All of these contexts are intertwined, and while they form separate contexts, they do not satisfactorily unravel. unravel. The Irish context spills into the British, and is in turn into the empire. In his break with Rome, Henry VIII by Irish and English statutes established the sovereigns of England as the temporary heads of the church in Ireland and in England. While the title varied somewhat over the years, the principle was established that the religion of the monarch was the religion of the realm and that which the people would be obliged to follow. The principle was recognized in Germany by the Peace of Augsburg 1558. The dominant principle was that the religious configuration of geographical space should follow the inclinations of its rulers. Ireland proved to be an outlier and remained so until the, till disestablishment, notwithstanding war in three kingdoms in the mid 17th century and the brief reign of James II in Ireland, which terminated with his flight from County Wexford following the Battle of the Boyne. The problem of religious disparity was addressed by penal legislation, which excluded Roman Catholics, the preponderant majority of the population, together with dissenters, from participation in the state as subjects or citizens. Such penal legislation was the norm in Europe, but in other jurisdictions, it was the minority who suffered its rigors. While this registration was relaxed in Ireland following the failure of the Stuart line, Roman Catholics in Great Britain and Ireland remained excluded from membership of Parliament in both London and Dublin. Rebellion and the French invasion of Ireland in the early stages of the Napoleonic Wars led to the union of the two kingdoms, but Pitt was unable to secure the consent of King George III to Catholic emancipation as a term of the Act of Union. Article 5 of the Acts of Union of 1800, there were two, one in London and one in Dublin, provided for the union of the churches of England and Ireland under the name the United Church of England and Ireland, and that the ecclesiastical law of the United Church would be English. The religious complexion of the United Kingdom then was Anglican in Ireland and England, including Wales, and Presbyterian in Scotland, both established churches, but with the Roman Catholic majority in Ireland. In 1829, Wellington carried Catholic emancipation with the consent of King George IV, who had visited Ireland in 1821. That enactment followed repeal of the Test Act in 1828, and permitted Roman Catholics to sit in Parliament. This marked a significant shift in the Constitution of the United Kingdom, inaugurating what may perhaps controversially be termed the Emancipation Settlement of 1829 to 38. In Ireland, the settlement 
reduced the influence of the church in public administration with the abolition of the parish as a religio-political network. The settlement reduced the size of the Irish Episcopate of 1833 from 22 dioceses in four provinces to 12 united dioceses in two provinces as sees fell vacant over the succeeding 13 years. A body corporate under the name Ecclesiastical Commissioners for Ireland was then established to manage church organization and property. In 1838, the settlement addressed the problem of the tithe in both jurisdictions as tithes were commuted into rent charges. We should now park the Irish strand and look at the developments in England following Catholic emancipation. Henry Carey has noted that the consequences of, the consequence of emancipation was the overthrow of the old regime in Britain and the class alliance of church and state that it represented. The reforms of the 1830s signaled a change in the church state relationship as the state began to treat the church as one amongst a number of denominations. There was a church objection also. Even if convocation met when ecclesiastical business was progressing in Parliament, Parliament was no longer the Anglican pillar of the Constitution. It embraced nonconformists, Roman Catholic, and others hostile to the Anglican Church. That created its own dissatisfaction. All of this English strand is not generally appreciated in Ireland. Change was signalled in a proposed section to the Church Temporalities Bill of 1833. The section was not included in the Act and suggested that surplus funds might be applied to such purposes as Parliament should hereafter appoint and direct, so raising the spectre of established church funds being applied for secular purposes. As the decade progressed, it became necessary, it became increasingly clear that the church could not rely upon the state to finance its development abroad. The empire was expanding and the chaplaincy model of pastoral care was proving inadequate. Development wa was essential as the society model represented by the Society for Propagation of the Gospel and the church, church missionary society by which the church navigated the restrictions of establishment was perceived to be deficient. It did not plant the church among settled expatriate Anglican communities. The necessity for Episcopal oversight came to be appreciated. This begged the question, what should be the nature, nature of the United Church of England and Ireland within the empire? While there were some examples of a church establishment in the West Indies, the church was not established in the emerging colonies of Australia, New Zealand and South Africa, and it was in them that the need for development was most pressing. To achieve independent action, the church required funds. These were raised following a meeting in London in April 1841 convened by Bishop Bloomfield of London and William Howley, Archbishop of Canterbury. A wide variety of Anglican churchmanship was represented at the meeting, which resolved to base future Anglican expansion upon the church's own principles of apostolic, apostolic order and discipline. It also adopted a resolution proposed by W.E. Gladstone that the fund should be administered by the bishops. In establishing the fund, the meeting recognized that if the state would not fulfill the duty of exporting Anglican Christianity to the colonies, the church must do so itself. There followed a meeting at Lambeth, where the bishops of the United Church of England and Ireland concurred and, and announced their intention to take charge of the fund. Gladstone was one of the three initial honorary treasurers whom they nominated, a role he would continue to fulfill until his death over 50 years later. Erastian instincts remained. 
so that the bishop sought and obtained from Parliament liberty to cons consecrate colonial bishops. Consecrations pursuant to the legislation required the warrant of the Queen under her royal signet and sign manual. The bishops so consecrated were issued with letters patent, defining their jurisdiction, and the Act recognised their capacity to consecrate other bishops and admit, and admit to the orders of priest and deacon. Such persons were not enabled to exercise their office in either England or Ireland. As Alfred Sachs has pointed out, Bloomfield's initiative made the extension of the church's central office dependent upon the new political style of voluntary association with public appeals for endowment, a recommendation which began a new expansion of the church. This brings us to empire and the third context for Irish disestablishment. Having decided upon Episcopally supervised churches in the colonies, the relationship in the colonies between bishops, clergy, and late members of the church had to be determined. Much work was done on this by Bishop Selwyn in New Zealand, consecrated 1841, and Bishop Gray in South Africa, consecrated 1847. The work of Gray would be tested by the awkward squad with litigation before the civil courts reaching London on appeal to the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council. Selwyn did not run into such difficulties. Over a period of 14 years following his arrival in New Zealand, Selwyn strove for a cons consensual arrangement between the members of his flock. Selwyn liaised with Bishop Broughton in Australia on common issues, attending a conference of bishops relating to church governance there in 1850. Broughton argued the act of supremacy did not apply outside England, and presumably, I may also add, Ireland. The meeting identified the evolutionary development that bishops and clergy should meet in synod concurrently with the laity meeting in convention. Selwyn prepared a constitution for his church, initially known as the United Church of England and Ireland in New Zealand. On 13th June, 1857, at the little wooden St. Stephen's Chapel overlooking Auckland Harbour, a constitution was adopted by the bishops and second clergy and laity representing a numerous body of the members of the United Church. That constitution was revised in 1865. As the driving force in the adoption of the constitution, Bishop Selwyn had one overarching principle. He could achieve nothing without the clergy and the laity while they could achieve nothing without him. And so church governance comprise bishops, clergy, and laity. As the church expanded with the empire, empire forced the clarification of legal pr principles as colonial churches explored their relationship with the mother country. Through litigation, rights were clarified, which would have a profound influence on the future shape of the Irish church. The voluntary nature of the United Church of England and Ireland in a new colony and the civil status of its bishops was highlighted in Regina v. Eaton College. Bishop Harper, then rector of Stratford Mortimer, Diocese of Oxford, was appointed by Queen Victoria to the See of Christchurch, New Zealand in 1856. That adversant was held by Eton College, which appointed to the vacant cure. The Crown objected, claiming the right to appoint as it had created the vacancy by an Episcopal appointment. The matter came before the Queen's bench in May, 1857. Judgment delivered in November, held that the bishopric of Christchurch had nothing in common with the bishopric in England or Ireland save that the bishop was a Protestant bishop 
canonically consecrated and held the faith of the Anglican Church. The court held that the bishopric of Christchurch had been created in valid exercise of the royal prerogative without the aid of any statute. The exercise of the prerogative in a newly settled colony was lawful, but the court found difficulty in seeing that the bishop had any jurisdiction except over those who voluntarily submitted to his jurisdiction and that in legal terms, such a bishop was really in the situation of a titular bishop equivalent to a bishop who had retired. Or V. Eaton, having described the status of a bishop consecrated for Episcopal ministry abroad, left for determination the relationship between the archbishop and his suffragans and the bishops with their clergy and laity. These issues were addressed in litigation from South Africa during the 1860s. A brief summary of the constitutional background is that in 1845, an independent legislature was created for Cape Town. And in 1847, the Reverend Robert Gray was consecrated for the newly established Diocese of Cape Town. In 1847, an independent legislature was created for Natal. And in 1850, representative government was established in the Cape of Good Hope. British Bishop Gray surrendered his earlier uh, letters patent in 1853 to facilitate the subdivision of Cape Town into three dioceses comprising in Africa, Cape Town, Natal, and Grahamstown. The Reverend John William Colenso was appointed and consecrated on 30th November, 1853 for the new bishopric of Natal. Bishop Gray was appointed Metropolitan of Cape Town under new letters patent issued on 8th December 1853. Crucially, the various letters patent were not authorized by legislation at Westminster, nor were they ratified by the local legislatures. The relationship between a cleric and his bishop was considered in long as be the Bishop of Cape Town. Proceedings were brought in 1863 by Bishop Gray before a newly established, before a court newly established by the Synod in his diocese. It was a court in which the Bishop presided, assisted by assessors who had been members of the Synod whose actions long disputed. The immediate cause was the refusal by Long to cooperate in giving notice for the election of lay delegates to a diocesan synod in Cape Town. Long maintained that it was contrary to the constitutions and laws and customs of the Church of England, that such a synod should be held without the, the authority of the Crown or the legislature, and that laws likely to be made at such a synod would tend to abridge the liberty of ministers and members of the Church of England in the colony. Ultimately, the matter became before the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council, which held that Long had voluntarily submitted himself to the authority of the Bishop of Cape Town by firstly taking, taking an oath of canonical obedience, secondly accepting a license to officiate, and thirdly accepting appointment to a living, all of which entitled to to the bishop to remove him for lawful cause. Was there a lawful cause? The letters patent issued to Bishop Gray by the Crown conferred upon the bishop no power of convening a meeting of clergy and laity elected in the manner prescribed by the bishop for the purpose of making laws binding upon churchmen. The committee further held that the synod so elected assumed some powers which only the legislature could possess. It regarded it as a mistake to consider it a synod at all. It was a body not for the purpose of taking counsel and advising together what may, might be best for the general good of the society, but for the purpose of agreeing upon certain rules 
and establish in, in fact certain laws by which all members of the Church of England in the colony, whether they assented to them or not, should be bound. The Judicial Committee also clarified that the oath of clerical obedience is restricted to commands which the, which the bishop is authorized to impose. It also highlighted the importance of conducting proceedings in a proper manner and engaging as assessors men of legal knowledge and habits who were unconnected with the dispute. Gray encountered further difficulties when as Metropolitan, he moved against John William Colenso, the Bishop of Natal, following publication of his controversial writings on the Old Testament. To Dermot McCulloch, Colenso was a polymath with an inconvenient Cornish propensity for pointing out truths to those disinclined to see them. To Paul Avis, Bishop Gray of Cape Town was militantly conservative a mild assessment compared with press comment at the time. After Gray sought to deprive Colenso of his see, three questions arose on a petition referred to the Judicial Committee. Were the letters patent appointing Dr. Gray legally valid? Was the coercive authority to Bishop Gray good as suffragan between Cape Town as Metropolitan and the Tau as suffragan? Did the oath of canonical obedience taken by Natal to Cape Town confer any jurisdiction to support the deprivation? On the first question, the court followed its decision in Long's case that the Crown had no authority to create an ecclesiastical corporation where there was a legislative authority. On the second question, the court held that it could not be held that any ecclesiastical tribunal or, juris or jurisdiction is required in any colony or settlement where there is no established church. And in, any, in the case of a settled colony, the ecclesiastical law of England cannot for the same reason be treated as part of the law which settlers carried with them from the mother country. Consequently, there was no power in the Crown to create any new or additional ecclesiastical or tribunal or jurisdiction, and no metropolitan or bishop in any colony having legislative institutions can, by virtue of the Crown's pat letters patent alone, exercise any coercive jurisdiction or hold court or tribunal for that purpose. On the third question of a contractual relationship and voluntary submission, there was no evidence of any such intention. Even if it was so intended, the Judicial Committee held that Natal was not competent, competent to give it, nor kept Cape Town to accept it or exercise such a jurisdiction. Subsequently, when the See of Rupert's Land in Canada fell vacant, the Archbishop of Canada, sorry, the Archbishop of Canterbury, concerned that there should not be a delay in consecrating a successor, wrote on the advice of the law officers to Cardwell, then colonial secretary. A mandate from the Queen issued to the Archbishop, authorizing him to consecrate a bishop, but Cardwell informed the House of Commons that no letters patent would be issued purporting to convey jurisdiction conferred by the Crown. Colenso's litigation continued. His stipend of 662 pounds 10 shillings was paid to him until April 1864, but was thereafter paid into a separate account by the treasurers of the Colonial Bishops Fund. Following judgment by the Judicial Committee on 20th March 1865, Colenso applied for payment of the arrears of his annual income, but this was declined. He therefore sued the treasurers of the fund, the Archbishops of Canterbury and York, and the Attorney General. W. E. Gladstone, a longtime treasurer, was the first named defendant on the writ. Romilly, master of the rose who heard the case, 
held that the previous cases of Long and Natal did not affect Colenso's status or position as a bishop of the Church of England generally, as he was not a bishop of any territory, see, or diocese, so that the powers Colenso derived from his orders were not affected. Romilly went on to find that the Bishop of Natal can exercise all the duties and perform all the acts which belong to a bishop within the Diocese of Natal that he could if he were the Bishop of an English Diocese, with this exception, that he cannot enforce execution of these orders without having recourse to the civil tribunals for that purpose. Later in the judgment, Romilly commented that there was not coercive jurisdiction which constituted a see or diocese. I'm sorry, I'll read that again. Romilly commented that it was not coercive jurisdiction which constituted a see or diocese. He instanced that Ignatius was as much Bishop of Antioch as Athanasius was Bishop of Alexandria, even though Athanasius had coercive power derived from the Christian religion having become the church of the state under the Emperor Constantine. Romilly's judgment, which runs to 36 pages in the law report, went on to reprove the Reverend Long's analysis that he, Long, was a member of the Church of England and not a member of a church in union and full communion with the Church of England, which in Long's opinion were two separate and distinct things. Romilly's judgment further identified badges of voluntary status. He stated that a bishop in England is the bishop over all the inhabitants within the diocese. A bishop in the colony is the bishop only over all the members of the Church of England resident within the colony. Such persons have in all matters ecclesiastical voluntarily submitted themselves to the control of the Bishop of Natal, so long as it is exercised within the scope of his authority, according to the principles prescribed by the Church of England. Romilly summed up his conclusions. The members of the church in South Africa may create an ecclesiastical tribunal to try ecclesiastical matters between themselves, and may agree that the decisions of such a tribunal shall be final, whatever their nature or effect. Upon this being proved, the civil tribunal would enforce such decisions against all persons who had agreed to be members of such an association. That is, against all persons who had agreed to be bound by these decisions. And it would do so without inquiring into the propriety of such decisions. But such an association would be distinct from and form no part of the Church of England, whether it did or did not call itself in union and full communion with the Church of England. He continued, but if the Episcopal Church in South Africa chose to remain part of the United Church of England and Ireland, then no such irresponsible tribunals could exist. And when recourse is had to the civil tribunal to enforce obedience to these decisions, they must be subject to revision to the extent laid down by the judgment in the case of Long v. Cape Town. When the first Lambeth Conference met in 1867 to consider all these developments and the scandal of Colenso's writings, all of them were considered by subcommittees which it established. The committees considered the synodical system, voluntary spiritual tribunals, the courts of metropolitans, the election of bishops, declaration of submissions to synod, the, provisional, the provincial subordination of, sorry, the subordination of diocesan synods to provincial synods. The Subcommittee on Synods, chaired by Bishop Selwyn of New Zealand, recommended a series of principles to govern synods, both diocesan and provincial, and their role in clerical discipline, ecclesiastical trials, patronage, 
and the erection of new dioceses. At this point, we must go back to the United Kingdom context to note the democratic spirit, spirit of the age and the widening of the franchise in the then United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland. The minority conservative government of Derby, led by Disraeli in the House of Commons, stole a march on the Liberals in 1867 when it proposed widening the franchise. This enlarged the electorate on both islands by admitting to the household franchise many nonconformist, and particularly in Ireland, Roman Catholic households. A general election was pending, but deferred until late 1868 while the electoral lists were updated. The altered franchise provided the opportunity for Gladstone to unite his party by making disestablishment the central issue of the 1868 election before a more radical electorate. Gladstone resolutions of the spring of 1868 urging disestablishment demonstrated that Disraeli was in office, but not necessarily in power. The urge to participate was not confined to the political process. Members of the Church of Ireland attended parish meetings to elect their representatives at diocesan meetings, which elected representatives to the Church Conference of Bishops, Clergy and Laity in April 1869, effectively lobbying against the disestablishment. They elected to the Lay Conference in September 1869, part of reconstituting the church, and in December, lay members to the convention that would adopt a constitution for the church. In preparation for these national meetings, there were some cases of collision between the emerging democratic politics and older forms of patrician manipulation. This journey through the context in which the spirit of the Church of Ireland was disestablished illuminates why the Church Act was drafted as it was. The intention of disestablishment and disendowment was not to suppress the church, but to free it from a Rastian restriction no longer justified in the changing political climate. The act did not release a flock of sheep on an unfamiliar mountain. Instead, it provided a framework for the reconstruction to begin in advance of this establishment of adopting the legal principles which we have seen established. Consequently, the change, whilst painful, was seamless. Gladstone had the knowledge to conceive disestablishment. As we have seen, when he proposed disestablishment, Gladstone was deeply immersed in the evolving Anglican Church. Yet his government refused to permit convocation to meet in Ireland. It had not met since 1715. For Gladstone would not facilitate the church meeting to do its business if it would not do the government's business. If the church would not negotiate, it would not be given a platform for opposition. By disestablishment, the union of the churches of England and Ireland would be dissolved and the church disendowed. The bishops and clergy would remain members of their order. With disestablishment, the bishops would lose their coercive jurisdiction under ecclesiastical law, but the church would need to maintain its discipline. Consequently, Ecclesiastical law would continue, but as a voluntary compact, its temporal terms to be enforced by the civil court, which would be loath to interfere, provided the procedures, were, the procedures adopted were fair and adhered to. There was little chance of interference in the short run, as so many of those elected to sit on the court of the General Synod were judges of the civil courts. The General Synod is the term used for the National Synod in Ireland relating to the entire island, so the word national was not appropriate, and then there were beneath it the 12 diocesans, the synods of the United Diocese. 
the act granted to the church authority to meet in synod to frame its constitution for future governance, leaving it to the church to work out the detail of that process. All ecclesiastical corporations were dissolved on disestablishment day, 1st January, 1871. A mechanism was provided to vest expropriated churches and cathedrals in use for worship in a representative church body incorporated by charter. It might purchase classical residences at a discount with funds raised in the parishes, but there was no general endowment. Such endowment as did occur arose by commutation and the purchase of clerical residences at concessionary prices. Commutation was a process whereby clergy converted the life annuity payable to them as compensation for loss of office into a capital sum payable to the representative church body. In all, 12 united dioceses, the threshold was reached to ensure the capital bonus was paid. The representative church body then assumed liability for remunerating commuting clergy. When it met, the convocation, the convention to draft the constitution for the church followed parliamentary procedures. This was unsurprising, given that the members included amongst its some 500 members, two dukes, some 13 peers, their younger brothers, and 16 members of parliament, roughly 10% of the convention. There were in addition, former members of parliament and candidates for election, not to speak of deputy lieutenants and justices of the peace who sat in the petty sessions. Feelings ran high. On more than one occasion, speakers gave up because of uproar made making their contributions inaudible. Others ran out of time. Members of like mind sat in party blocks. Parliamentary devices were adopted, such as seeking termination of a debate by moving the previous question. If a decision was not clear cut or representatives wished to have their votes publicly recorded, the house divided with two tellers being appointed for each side or on a division by orders, two tellers for each order on each side. Votes by orders could be requested. The constitution was adopted after 57 days of debate divided between a spring and an autumn session. On at least two occasions, the convention nearly broke down, but compromises were found, brokered by the Duke of Abercorn, who was between his two periods as Lord Lieutenant of Ireland. Comparing the prefaces to the church constitutions of Canada, New Zealand, and Ireland, it was common case that by different wording, the preambles and declarations acknowledged the primacy of scripture, the Book of Common Prayer, including the ordinal in both New Zealand and Ireland, and the 39 Articles of Religion. The Canadian declarations envisaged a role for the Crown in regulating the appointment of bishops, priests, and deacons, and the division of the province into dioceses as occasion might require. In New Zealand, the church declined authority to authorize, sorry, in New Zealand, the church declined authority to alter the authorized version of the Bible or the formularies of the church, unless adopted by the United Church of England and Ireland with the consent of the crown and convocation. The Church of Ireland would continue to use the formularies subject to such alterations only as be made therein from time to time by the lawful authority of the church. There was no reference to the crown. Both Canada and New Zealand regarded themselves as integral parts of the United Church of England and Ireland. Archdeacon Stopford, who as a guest at Howarden had assisted Gladstone in understanding the intricacies of the Church of Ireland, proposed an additional declaration that the Church of Ireland will maintain communion with the, the sister Church of England and with all other Christian churches agreeing in the principles of this declaration. 
painful though it was, the Irish church in applying the jurisdiction, jurisprudence of the Long and Natal cases acknowledged this change wrought by the Irish Church Act. The Church of Ireland would not be part or a branch of the Church of England. That union was severed by Parliament, and there so would be a communion of churches, not a single body under the primacy of Canterbury. This was copper fastened in the final declaration prefixed to the Constitution of the Church of Ireland. It provided that the Church of Ireland, deriving its authority from Christ, who is the head over all things to be to the Church, be, doth declare that the General Synod of the Church of Ireland, consisting of the Archbishop, Bishops and Bishops of the, of, I'm sorry, doth declare that the General Synod of the Church of Ireland, consisting of the Archbishops and Bishops and of the representatives of the clergy and laity, shall have chief legislative power therein, and such administrative power as may be necessary for the church and consistent with its Episcopal constitution. Gladstone was heavily criticized for his treatment of the Irish church. In reality, for all that the Church of Ireland at the time did not appreciate it, this establishment was fortuitous and occurred at a most opportune time. There are two aspects to this. Firstly, 1869 to 71 was a time of prosperity for a population significantly depleted by the consequences of the Great Famine in the late 1840s. United Kingdom interest rates were falling. Irish rents, which were then pay well paid, would subsequently decline in the late 1870s in the wake of the uh, competition from America and poor harvests. Although there was some provision for the sale of holdings to tenanted farms, the land acts were still in the future. These acts introduced fair rent, free sale and fixity of tenure and subsequently state assisted purchase of the freehold all of which negatively affected the capital value of the landlord's interest upon which many clergy had depended for their income, in addition to the tithe. In 1869 to 71, clerical incomes were at the apex of their security, so optimizing the accruing compensation. Secondly, as this establishment occurred prior to both land reform of 1871 to 1907 and the War of Independence, which followed the 1916 rebellion. The church was not embroiled in those controversies. Undoubtedly, members had their opinions, but they were private and not institution, institutional, so that the church did not become a target in either struggle. Had the church been an established church during the latter period, the nationalist struggle might well have taken on a sectarian as opposed to a political character. Ireland and the church were well spared that. Thank you for your help and attendance. Robert, thank you so much for that uh, fantastic lecture. There's so much in that and um, uh, you've really taken us through, as the title of the lecture said, through the context of disestablishment, the context globally, politically, socially, um, ecclesiastically. So thank you. I'm sure everybody's thoughts are, are buzzing and, and I, um, we have time for some questions if you're willing to, to answer them. Um, before that, I just wanted to, one or two people um, arrived late because um, Sadly, the link didn't get through. So uh, the, the link that was sent. So apologies to those. Um, and we are hoping to put the recording of this lecture on YouTube for those who may have missed the beginning, but uh, glad that you're able to be here now. Um, so in a moment, we'll come to questions and you could indicate that you'd like to ask a question by raising your hand, which might be under the reactions button on Zoom or writing it in, into the chat 
and then I will then I will co call that. But I wonder, Robert, if I could start by asking a question, if you could um, say something about the wonderful image behind you on the Zoom screen. Yes, um, that's a piece of uh, impishness on my part. Can you put it back to speaker view? Um, oh, yes. Go. Now, um, can I succeed in doing this? This is the occasion in St. Patrick's Cathedral in April 1870, 1868. It's actually, I think, Easter, the Saturday after Easter, when the Prince of Wales was instituted by the then Marquess of Abercorn. He was subsequently raised to, to, to uh, a duke in Ireland. The Marquis of Abercorn is investing the Prince of Wales, subsequently Edward the Seventh, as a knight of the Order of St. Patrick. And you can see, can I get the, now, the, there is the future King Edward the Seventh. That is the Duke of Abercorn. There is the Princess of Wales, Queen Alexandra. Um, above, just above my head, uh, there, in blue. Blue is the colour of the Knights of St. Patrick. And you will often see a canon of St. Patrick's Cathedral wearing a, 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 sl a small piping under his collar uh, in that blue, light blue colour of St. Patrick's. Um, the, you can see, it's behind my head, there is a, a, a man just there with the bobbed wig and gold robes. That is the Lord Chancellor of Ireland. These knights in blue are uh, the, 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 they are the Marquis of Cunningham, Slane Castle, Lord Hedford of Kells, Lord Downshire of what is now Royal Hillsborough, and the Marquis of Drogheda, whose house, Moore Hall, was subsequently bought by Count John McCormack. Um, the gentleman in red on the, sorry, it's very difficult when it's mirrored. The gentleman in red there is the Under Secretary for, in military uniform, is the Under Secretary for Ireland. And, um, but that's the occasion. And there is, Queen Victoria was very upset at Gladstone's resolutions. One of those had the temerity to state, to request the Queen to put at Parliament's disposal her interest in the Irish Church, which of course was the rights of the rights of patronage to the bishoprics and a number of adversaries. Um, now, the timing of this is extraordinary because of the constitutional nature of nominating the Prince of Wales and having a big occasion like this, which really is the last great occasion of the established Church of Ireland. Nothing like this would ever happen again, even though there would be during the First World War a memorial service in the cathedral following the death of Kitchener, who, uh, in, in, uh, who was torpedoed on his way to Murmansk. Um, but, and this is the last pageantry in the Church of Ireland. And with this establishment, the Knights moved to St. Patrick's Hall. And the extraordinary thing about Ireland is that the banners of the Knights, as of the 1st of January, 1871, continue to hang in the chancel of St. Patrick's Cathedral under the night stalls, over the night stalls, and in St. Patrick's Hall, where the presidents of Ireland are inaugurated, the banners of the Knights of St. Patrick, as at 1921, 50 years later, also continue to hang. So that's the, the, the background to the picture. It seemed appropriate for tonight. Absolutely, fantastic, thank you. Um, well, we've got a few questions appearing in the chat. So um, I'll ask um, 
uh, Patricia and then Orga to give their questions. So, uh, Patricia, would you like to ask your question? Yes, I'm just going to try and put myself into the gallery view here. Yeah, I found myself. Yes, so I was trying to sift through the very revelatory point that you made that the actual Colenso case dispute resolution influenced the disestablishment of the Irish church. But I was wondering, did you mean through the mind of Gladstone or through the mechanisms of the creation of a voluntary society or some other way? Uh, thank you, Patricia. I think that what Gladstone was deeply, hasn't been given credit for his, in, in political terms in Ireland, for his deep understanding of the church. Uh, he had done a bold fast, moving from a very high churchman against in, a Rastian approach to the church in 1840 to his disestablishment position in 1869. And that was, as he saw it, for the good of the church and that the, the moribund condition of the Church of Ireland as an, a state church was doing it no good in 1870 and 1868 and could only lead to further trouble. The legal principles were evolving. I don't believe Gladstone had an influence on those beyond discussion, but it was their recognition by the Privy Council, which provided a solution to the problem of how do you move from a church which is a government department for the benefit of all the people to a church which is a voluntary society like the Presbyterian church outside Scotland, like the Society of Friends and like, the Meth like Methodism, all having their voluntary compacts. And when this emerges from the colonies, it becomes the vehicle by which the disestablished can can be achieved. And fundamental to achieving that was dissolution of the Union of 1800, because you couldn't have a church in the United Kingdom where part of it was established and part of it was disestablished. Wow. That's fantastic. That's, that's as I understand, I, yeah. that's as I understand the, legal, the legal concept. Mm. Yeah. Thanks uh, very much for that question. If I can um, take August's question next, following which I'll come to Charlotte. Thank you. Um, yes. Uh, the speaker, I can't see him at the moment because of my settings, but the speaker is no doubt familiar with the hymn written by Mrs. Alexander of All Things Bright and Beautiful fame at the time of the 1869 Act. Um, Look down, Lord of heaven, on our desolation. Fallen, fallen, fallen is now our country's crown. Darkly dawns the new year on a churchless nation. Ammon and Amalek tread our borders down. Now, the attitude shown in that hymn or that verse is that only an ecclesiastical structure established by law could be a church. And once that had gone, Ireland would be a churchless nation. A voluntary society could not be a church in her language. My question is how widespread was that attitude in the 1870s? Um, I think it was quite widespread. Her husband, of course, was Bishop of Derry subsequently primate and was a member of the House of Lords at the time of disestablishment and made one of the final speeches by a Church of Ireland bishop, but I should say by an Irish bishop in the House of Lords until Lord Eames was uh, ennobled as a life peer. Um, but th that was a particularly Tory viewpoint. And it was the viewpoint 
that goes back to the Peace of Augsburg, that the church had to have its moral position, but it was a Tory position, whereas the Whig position uh, had been the other way, that, that they would look to see that they had to, as a civil society, th that civil society had to embrace everybody. And um, of course, Disraeli would not have be, been a member of the House of Commons or become prime minister if his father hadn't fallen out with the synagogue in London and Disraeli was baptized as a Christian. Um, but yes, that opinion comes through and there was a bitter proposal to insert a into the preface to the pre into the preamble of the preface that the church had been outrageously disestablished by parliament and going down that line but the convention rejected it it felt it was a step too far it didn't have the decorum and the preface simply reads whereas the church has been disestablished by parliament a statement of fact without opinion but yes it was a, a widely held viewpoint which the church had to move away from. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Org, for that question. So um, if Charlotte, you would like to ask your question and, and then I think we'll, we'll go to Matt. Um, Hello. Um, thank you for that. Sorry if you can see me pulling faces or hear untoward activity in the background domestic chaos is in in progress um i think following on from august point i was just i think i would make the point that the idea of the colonial bishoprics fund as a kind of adventure in voluntaryism and voluntary church expansion is a bit problematic um, because even if we're willing to kind of get our heads around the idea that a church can be a church without establishment, we certainly find very strongly entrenched attitudes that a church cannot be an Anglican church without establishment and you can't have Anglicanism without establishment. And, um, there is a strong sense that the benefactors of the Colonial Bishoprics Fund understood themselves to be funding the export of the Anglican establishment. And certainly, I'm just thinking of Angela Burdett Coots, who is one of the big donors, who is a very interesting character, and not least because she's one of the few women who you see in the records on this, but she expends considerable amounts of time, energy, legal resources, etc., contesting the idea that what she's funded is voluntary church expansion into the empire. And, you know, even going so far as to seek legislative action to redress the situation. Um, and in an act of shameless self-promotion, I would say, if you want to hear more about this, come to my lecture shortly. Um, but yeah, I'm just sort of reflecting on that, really. Uh, my thinking on that would be that this is where law creates opportunities that may run beyond what people originally anticipated or thought. Um, the difficulty was that Parliament wouldn't provide funds to enable the church to expand in the colonies. And people's religious commitment was such that they needed that organization. There was no other way to fund it but voluntarily, because if you go went out to the individual colonies, you would find that you would be asking a, uh, 
local legislature once one had been authorized to establish a church where there was going to be a variety of religio-political opinion. And a classic example of that is the way things worked out in the United States, where uh, while you have the Episcopal Church, you had the Episcopal Church already in place with the constitution going back to the 18th century, uh, having the, it had obtained the Episcopal orders via Scotland, um, not through England, and you have, have there the predominant church became Baptist. And so, as, as I feel, there, there is, I recognize in what you're saying, a tension between the intention of the people who established the bishop, the colonial bishops fund, and what actually worked out. And yet you find that the person who embraces this voluntarist uh, argument and puts it through in legislation is a treasurer of the colonial bishops fund and uh, had to be aware of all of these uh, difficult he was aware of all of this um, development he was aware of the financing of it he was in he 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 did not approve of Bishop Colenso's writing. And there's one quotation I have seen where he wrote that he would rather see the dream aspires of Oxford level than adopt Colenso's opinion or follow Colenso's opinion. But he adopts the voluntarist system and, and, and the principles that Colenso had clarified. And Romilly had clearly, in legal terms, that quotation about the two um, Roman Empire time bishops uh, in Antioch and Alexandria, to my mind, if the church is going to be Catholic, based on its Catholic tradition, claiming its original heritage, then I can't see how one can, um, I can't see how that legal position will hold, that it has, the Ang Anglicanism can only exist if it's a state church. Th th thanks very much, um, Charlotte, for that question. And uh, people who are interested in Charlotte's lecture, it's on the 18th of May in London. It's an in-person ELS event you can book through the website. Um, so um, Matt's question next, and, and then there's another comment in the chat from, Zoo, uh, from June. Thank you very much, Father Russell. Um, just reflecting back from the, from the Welsh context, um, in addition to all the uh, rude things I could say about Lloyd George, I always knew that he was a shameless plagiarist. And um, when noting the near identical wording of the uh, Welsh Church Act to uh, so much of what had come before and um, so much of the procedure around it um, being so familiar to um, a lawyer sitting here in Cardiff. Um, my question was in relation to the Constitution, because the other thing I've um, noticed since arriving here in Wales is just how much of the Constitution hasn't actually been touched in the uh, 100, just over 100 years since our um, disestablishment. And I was just wondering whether that's the same in Ireland too. No, we regularly touch it. Um, in fact, I, I, the difficulty with it actually is that the constitution of the Church of Ireland is not a constitution in the sense that you would take uh, the American written constitution or the constitution of the Irish Republic. Uh, it's the constitution of the church is much more like a codified English constitution where all of the acts are brought together to form a single statute that is updated every 10 or 20 years. Um, what I would regard as the real constitution is the, the preface comprising the preamble and the declarations of principles. Um, the doctrinal provisions uh, and the ritual provision, doctrinal provisions don't get touched. The ritual provisions do, and the canons do. Um, 
uh, uh, and we we included followed the recent one of the disciplinary members of one of the disciplinary measures of the Church of England was adapted to Irish circumstances and included in the constitution of the Church of Ireland uh, alongside the um, diocesan and general synod court system. So yes, we do have a very active interference with the constitution, but when you see a constitution that includes doc material relating to security for costs, you know that it goes a very great deal further than structure. Thanks very much, Matt, for that question. I think the, probably the last question we have time for is, is from June. So if I can ask you to ask, ask your question, June. On mute. Yes, am I busy? <laughs> the Church of Ireland of my youth. Uh, I one was always brought up, and now I'm going to have my illusions shattered. One was always brought up that the bishops financially did very badly out of this establishment. The clerics may have done a little better. Certainly, if you were a cleric in Kerry and Cork during the Tithe Wars in the 1840s, you'd have starved if you hadn't been burnt out. But uh, is, that, is that the financial reality? And again, one of my childhood myths was that, and you touched on the number of dukes and lord lieutenants and whatever uh, forming the uh, initial debates, um, did the Church of Ireland's general membership increase for the decade after disestablishment, uh, bluntly because of snobbery. It was the perceived as the state church in all but name. But the financial aspect I'm interested in. Uh, the, I don't have the figures at the fin my fingertips, but the palace, I've got through this on a number of points. The palace in Armagh was on, in 1860 was on something like 400 acres, 350, 360, something like that. Uh, it included, the palace included 10 acres of uh, gardens and supportive grounds. Uh, what was acquired from the church temporality commissioners was 85 acres rather than the four, 350. Mm. Um, uh, the Archbishop of Dublin continued to reside in his house number 16, St. Stephen's Green. Uh, in terms of annual stipends, there was a massive reduction. Mm -hmm. But in, and in terms of compensation, there were 12 bishops and type, there were 12 bishops of whom 11 commuted and then accepted the remuneration provided to them by the RCB. But did not Mrs. Alexander have to lose her a uh, rather large carriage, carriage establishment well, because the money wasn't there. Well, what, what, I, having been yes, married but, into Derry, you would have expected well, that. Bishop, Ale Bishop Alexander um, was entitled to a huge annuity, a huge sum of money. He Indeed. commuted his annuity. Mm -hmm. And even with what he had gained, the, when one looks at his will and his charitable the charitable things which he did, there was a lot of wealth. Um, but yes, the bishops did take a financial hit, mm -hmm. but their income was unsustainable. It was unjustifiable. It was in, I'm not going to go into saying, taking a moral judgment on it at the time, but they were being paid sums like the monies being paid to the Lord Chancellor. Now, no, I, in I terms of the clergy on the ground, there were 
there were clergy drawing incomes of 100 pounds mm. and less. Mm. There were clergy, there is criticism of there being, um, what's the expression, plurality. But to the extent that that happened, uh, it was authorized because the cures were so small and the income was so small, the number of parishioners was so small. Mm. But particularly in Ulster, the church had been endowed with, at the time of the Ulster plantation. Mm. And so you come across townlands uh, with the name Glebe on them, mm. which is an indication of a church association. But this is drifting away from your question. The answer is yes, there was a leveling down on Episcopal income and a leveling up on uh, Parsons income, but this too still remained with a considerable difference. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Jean, for that question. And um, wonderful to have had so many questions. And I'm going to draw matters to a close because I am a, uh, I don't know if this is the custom in the Church of Ireland, but as a Church of England clergyman, I can't let people go without another notice. And I want to let people know that you've still got one hour until eight o'clock this evening to sign up for the Lindwood Lecture, which is on the 22nd of March. And this is an, um, an ecumenical lecture um, which alternates between the, being organised by the Ecclesiastical Law Society and, as it is this year, the Canon Law Society of Great Britain and Ireland. And uh, this year we have Father James Conn speaking about clergy discipline in the Roman Catholic Church. This is an in person event in London. Um, it's on the Ecclesiastical Law Society website. <clears throat> As I say, you've got just over an hour if you want to sign up to that. And if you're watching this on YouTube, I'm afraid you've missed the boat. Um, Robert, thank you so much for the, the lecture this evening. It's been a real pleasure to hear everything you, you've had to say and, and to, to be a, a part of the debate and the questions which have been stimulated. And in those last questions touching on clergy re remuneration, remuneration and uh, stipends and income puts me in mind of Trollope novels. And it's been a while since I've uh, read Phineas Redux, but I think it's in that novel that the conservative administration um, moves to bring in the disestablishment of the church. And the conservatives do that, I think, not because they're particularly keen on the idea, but because they think they'll do it better than anyone else. And, uh, and what I think is we, we've had a lecturer who is talking to us about the disestablishment of the Irish church has done it better than anyone else. So really appreciate um, all, all that, that, that you've done. Your huge encyclopedic knowledge and expertise has, has been a real blessing to us this evening, Robert. So thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. And I hope everyone, this is St. Patrick's Eve. I hope you enjoy it on St. Patrick's Day tomorrow. Indeed. God bless and good, good night. night. Bye bye, everyone.